Hey guys, it's Dr. Green. I wanted to really quickly, I know there were a couple of you that did not get a chance to come to class yesterday for various reasons. Uh, so, uh, as requested, um, I'm doing a quick, uh, quick, quick overview of the neuro lecture um, from yesterday. So, in advance, please forgive the speed uh, with which I move through this. I'm going to move kind of fast, uh, but I've just got. Uh, family obligation soon, so I need to uh, kind of work with a bit of a quickness here. So I apologize in advance if it's, um, if I go through it quickly. So give me just one second here, find the right screen. Just need, okay, perfect. Sorry, guys. Technology is not cooperating. One second. Perfect. Okay, finally. Okay. So, uh, guys, we spent so. Thursday, yesterday, uh, talking about the nervous system and special senses, right? So I know that, that uh, for a lot of you that have had anatomy and physiology already, this is going to be extremely basic, but uh, we're going to do just a quick uh, blitz through this for those that were not in class. Okay, here's the deal. So obviously we know that the nervous system is composed of the brain and spinal cord, obviously peripheral nerves and special sense organs, right? So clearly, right, the brain and spinal cord is what makes up our CNS, but our peripheral nerves, including our cranial nerves, um, are actually what compose the peripheral nervous system. So there are times, though, within our, our anatomical makeup, uh, this occurs in the upper extremity and the lower extremity, uh, where we have essentially networks of nerves that arise from the spinal cord, peripheral nerves that arise from the spinal cord and provide essentially mass innervation to the extremities. Uh, a uh, key examples of that anatomically are the brachial plexus, uh, and then the lumbar plexus. So the brachial plexus originates from nerve root C5 through T1, uh, innervating the arm and hand. And then the lumbar plexus originates essentially from uh, nerve roots L1 through S2 and innervates uh, the lower extremity, right? So we know based on anatomy and physiology that we have two divisions of the nervous system, right? We have the somatic nervous system uh, that controls essentially limbs, skeletal muscle, those types of things, right? And then the autonomic nervous system, which controls visceral organs, uh, those types of things, right? So the somatic nervous system, as we know of, right, is chiefly responsible for innervation of, mus of muscles, fascia, right, and skin, uh, and ultimately, Right, the way that those are that those are organized rather, and described anatomically, um, are dermatomes and myotomes. So a dermatome is essentially an area of skin or fascia uh, that is essentially innervated by a peripheral nerve. The example that we give here is the C5 dermatome, uh, which is the lateral aspect of the shoulder. Right, so that's uh, the peripheral nerve. There is the axillary nerve, um, and so uh, innervated by the C5 nerve root, though. Right, myotomes. Okay, conversely, describe the innervation of muscle, right, corresponding to a spinal nerve root. So in this case, right, C5, the, the dermatome and myotome are in the same location, right? So action of my deltoid, right, is going to be governed by the C5 myotome. All right. So let's say, for example, that somebody had essentially maybe a disc herniation or a pinched nerve at C5. They might report, right? some numbness or tingling at the lateral aspect of the shoulder uh, and or maybe even some weakness, right? So we know, and we've talked about this already, that the autonomic nervous system, right, regulates essentially the response of viscerous smooth muscle and cardiac muscle, right, in the adipose tissue and glands. Now, we know that the autonomic nervous system has both sympathetic uh, divisions and a parasympathetic division, right? So the sympathetic division essentially uh, 
down regulates, right? It essentially kind of down regulates and or decreases the function uh, of the viscera, right? Uh, particularly our GI tract, right? And we gave the example of working out and essentially, you know, at the end of your workout as, as parasympathetic stimulation turns back on and upregulates the viscera and the autonomic nervous system uh, that ultimately many of us have the sensation of having to go to the bathroom, right? As our stomach contents and our GI contents are emptied into the uh, inferior aspect of the colon, right? So uh, obviously parasympathetic activity upregulates our, our autonomic system and sympathetic activity downregulates the abdominal viscera, right, in the autonomic system. Uh, interestingly enough, anatomically, there has been some discourse, there has been some discussion about uh, essentially calling this division, particularly the division uh, of the nervous system that essentially innervates the GI tract, uh, calling it the enteric division, uh, simply because the function of this of this anatomical region, at least in regards to its uh, neurophysiology, is so unique, right? So we know that if we look at the contents of a, of, of a nerve cell, right? Generally speaking, we know that it's made up of a cell body, right? Uh, cell membrane, right? With a nucleus uh, there at the cell body and dendrites, which are the little fingerlets that essentially receive the input, uh, excuse me, from a neurotransmitter, right? And or from a, neighbor, a neighboring nerve cell, right? And then the, the nerve impulse is propagated down the axon. And we said in class on Thursday, that generally speaking, a, an axon that is non-myelinated, generally speaking, is going to send messages at a slower rate than an axon that is myelinated. And the reason for that is that that ultimately that nerve impulse cannot pass through the myelin sheath, right, due to its makeup, right? Therefore, on an axon, on an, on a myelinated axon, we have essentially what's called a saltatory response or essentially a jumping response, right? If you know Latin or Spanish. Um, Saltar means to jump, and so ultimately the, the impulse will jump from one node of Ronvier, right, that's a French word, Ronvier, to uh, one node to another, right, until it reaches the end of the nerve cell uh, and then synapses with another nerve. Okay, so here's the deal. Yesterday we had the time of our lives, obviously, learning a little bit about reflexes, uh, both deep, deep tendon and pathologic, right, super fun, um, but Ultimately, the way that a lot of our reflex arcs uh, and a lot, a lot of, well, let me back up. The way that a lot of our neural, the, the way that a lot of our neural input works is that ultimately we receive stimulation, right? Uh, generally, we use the example here of the skin. Someone touches you and the sensation of them touching you travels up the afferent nerve, right? To the spinal cord where uh, the afferent nerve essentially synapses, right? Or comes together with the efferent nerve at what's called the inner neuron right at the spinal cord uh, and depending on the um on the nature of the impulse but also the nerve fibers that are that are uh, essentially uh, stimulated and activated right during that sensory response the impulse travels up to the brain as it and is interpreted and then right back down the spinal cord to the efferent nerve out to a muscle the classic example of this is touching is touching a hot stove right so ultimately we have these big uh these big, uh, you know, type A fibers that are myelinated, and we put our hand on the stove when we, for, when we, you know, maybe you're not paying attention, and burn our hand, and right and right away immediately notice, right, that the stove is hot, and so we immediately pull our hand away, right. That's an example of essentially a, uh, um, an afferent nerve synapsing with obviously the inner neuron of the spinal cord, and then having that muscular response and pulling away uh, from the uh, based on the efferent pathway. Okay, so here's the deal. We know that obviously based on, um, you know, for those of us that have taken anatomy, the brain itself is very complex um, and essentially it's composed of various types of neurons, right? So we have the frontal lobe, uh, which essentially uh, is going to govern obviously executive functioning, planning, those types of things. Then we have the precentral gyrus and the postcentral gyrus, gyrus rather. Um, and these actually are part of what's called the homunculus, right? That's going to essentially regulate both sensory and motor function of the brain. Um, so we have the temporal lobe. If you kind of imagine you were wearing like a little bit of a boxing glove, the thumb part of that would be the temporal lobe, uh, and that tends to help us govern govern memory, right? And then obviously the parietal lobe as well, uh, the occipital lobe, which lobe which governs which governs vision. Uh, the parietal lobe does have some function, obviously, in speech. 
um, and other higher order functions. Uh, but then obviously we see this guy down here at the very bottom, almost kind of looks like a little piece of cauliflower sometimes. And that is essentially the uh, um, cerebellum. And the cerebellum actually regulates balance uh, centrally. And we have other mechanisms uh, that we won't discuss in this class that help us regulate balance actually uh, as well. But the cerebellum is, is the main portion of the um, of the hindbrain that actually regulates balance. Okay, what about the eye though? Okay, the eye itself is, a, is an extremely complex special sense organ. So if you look at the eye, we know that we have an anterior chamber and a posterior chamber, okay? Uh, essentially, the iris itself kind of makes the division, right, between the anterior and posterior chamber. So, and obviously we have the lens here uh, as well, um, but within the anterior chamber, we have this fluid, right, right, called aqueous humor, right? And then in the posterior chamber of the eye, we have a fluid called vitreous humor. Uh, and these, these fluids are extremely important, not, not only helping maintain the shape of the eye, uh, but also obviously nourishing, nourishing nerve cells. Um, so when we, when we see, right, ultimately the image is essentially the light is brought into the eye through the, through the pupil. And as we know, in a dark room, the people will, will uh, kind of relax. But in a, in a brighter room, the people will, will generally constrict, right? And so ultimately, what we see is that this optic nerve, we see this, this huge optic nerve, okay, on the back side of the eye, on the posterior aspect of the eye, um, that essentially innervates the retina. And you can see the retina is this large structure in the back of the eye. Well, the, the retina's job is to essentially decode right? Essentially assist us in decoding vision, right? To essentially order images to allow us to decode vision. Um, so I work, uh, I work clinically at the airport uh, and uh, on the industrial medicine team for Delta Airlines. And we had a, a woman uh, about a month ago slip on the tarmac while guiding a plane into the, the jet bridge, uh, slipped on the ice and hit her head and detached her retina, right? And had visual changes uh, in the eye uh, and was not able to see. Um, so, sorry, Google's yelling at me. I apologize, guys. Um, all right, here we go. So, um, ultimately, right, uh, the, the eye itself is obviously very complex, but there are specialized neurons, obviously, inside of the retina uh, that, that help us essentially to uh, regulate that vision. So, the eye itself, right, as well as, so we have structures that actually allow us to not only kind of govern motility of the eye, but also lubrication of the eye. So, we have on the, the first picture, we have these four muscles. We have the, and these are called the rectus muscles, okay? And the function of the rectus muscles actually are to move the eye up and down, left and right, right? And there are times, and you can see that the bone surrounding the eye socket is called the orbit. Um, in the event that someone sustains a traumatic injury, uh, to the eye, generally speaking, the location of the fracture, sometimes the fracture segment can actually entrap uh, one of the muscles and it can actually affect eye motility. So for example, let's say someone has a fracture at the bottom part of the eye, right? Uh, or the bottom part of the orbit rather. And the, inf and the, the fracture segments actually essentially uh, entrap the inferior rectus muscle. So in that type of an injury, often what we see is that the eye, is, that when the, when the patient tries to look up, that the eye itself will actually stay fixed. Whereas the uninvolved eye will actually be able to look upwards, but the one that actually uh, is, in, you know, the, the the side with the orbital blowout fracture uh, will actually stay kind of stationary and, and not be able to have the same motility, right? And so we see obviously in the picture on the right, our lacrimal, our lacrimal glands that are responsible for maintaining obviously the moisture of the eye. Uh, sometimes these can be affected in, in people that have allergies uh, and can be responsible for symptoms of dry eye, right? And this is the, uh, these are the glands that function oh so well uh, whenever we are upset and or uh, emotional. So, all right, guys, sorry, and once again, sorry, I'm moving so fast, but breaking down the ear, so the ear itself, right, we have three sections, so we have the, the external ear, sorry, that's my dog chewing on a toy, if you, that sound is distracting, um, so we have the external ear, which is essentially its function is to funnel sound, right? Then we have the middle ear. So the function of the middle ear, as you can see, is that, begin, that begins at the tympanic membrane or the eardrum, right? As it's commonly referred to. Within the, within the middle ear, we have three bones. We have the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. And those vibrations of the malleus, incus, and the stapes actually allow us, to, pardon me, to filter and conduct sound, right? Um, so... Ultimately here, you know, 
uh, I've, I've known people uh, that have had a very difficult time hearing uh, and a, a family friend uh, had actually had a prosthetic incus uh, placed inside of their ear and that actually allowed them to regain a, a large amount of their hearing. Uh, like, you know, kind of mentioned on Thursday, this person, even though this is, you know, they've, they've had this done, this is, they're still the loudest person in the room every single time. Uh, but uh, it's amazing what they can do uh, with, with some of these uh, synthetic, uh, you know, ossicles in the, in, the, in the year that they have come up with. Uh, and so here's the deal, guys. The inner ear itself, its main function is to regulate balance. So we can see here too, right, that the, obviously the cochlea here, and we have the, the, the utricle and then the semicircular canals, they have a direct innervation, as we can see, by the vestibular nerve. So their function is to control balance. So how does that work? So if we look, we can see that there are hair cells actually surround, uh, that sit inside of a matrix, right, called the otolithic membrane. Now, there, and, you know, and you can see that as we move, potentially if I move my head down and up or side to side, those otoliths will shift inside of that gel membrane, right, and will actually, um, will actually uh, help us maintain equilibrium. Right. However, uh, sometimes due to tra to traumatic injury and or blow to a blow to the to the the head and or any other mechanism, sometimes as we get older, these otoliths will actually kind of uh, break down and they will actually kind of uh, sometimes make their way out of the the utricle and the, the utricle and saccule on the other side of the cochlea here, and they'll make their way into the semicircular canals. Okay. When that happens, we often experience a condition known as BPPV or benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Okay, this can be very debilitating for those that deal with it, um, but there are various diagnostic maneuvers, um, such as the Dix Hall Pike maneuver that, that uh, can be utilized to diagnose uh, BPPV, right? Um, and then we can use a, a maneuver like the Epley maneuver uh, to, to relocate uh, these otoliths, right? To, to relieve symptoms. Uh, this is a very common problem, with, especially with concussion at times with people that have persistent dizziness as well. Okay, so guys, into terms, uh, for those of you that were, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here uh, because I do, I do have to sign off, um, but um, these are the terms that we have essentially, uh, that we covered in class. I would encourage you to review these um, as well, please. And so, uh, but I wanted to go ahead and just kind of give you just an overview of this. Okay, but please let me know if there are questions. Um, so this has been recorded. It's going to take a little bit for this to process, um, but I will I will put it up. Um, so uh, you may see that depending on how long it takes, it may come up tonight. Uh, but if not, you'll see it tomorrow evening. OK, uh, have a great weekend, you guys. And for those of you that weren't in class, uh, hopefully we will see you Tuesday. OK, have a great uh, have a great uh, weekend. Be safe.